Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Romans in a contextual way, and by that I mean we've been treating it as a single message instead of isolated pieces. I'm afraid we're guilty in the modern church of dividing the Bible up into individual phrases and sentences and then trying to apply those to our lives when the truth is sometimes we miss the overarching theme of the uh, whole book. And so I've been trying to go through Romans in a little more systematic way that we can catch the beauty of the overall argument. We have seen the disappointment and shame and even horror of Romans chapter 7 as someone tries to live a religious life without the power of the Holy Spirit. We came to the beautiful mountain peak of Romans 8 where it could almost be called the Spirit's chapter. For the, word, the uh, term for Spirit has only been used twice in the book of Romans all the way through chapter 7 but suddenly in chapter 8 it's used 20 plus times. This mountain peak of the grace and love of God starts out with no condemnation, moves into the Spirit-filled life and the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And yet I think Paul realized that to paint a picture so perfect, so wonderful about the Christian life would be in a sense, to misinform Christians of the awful struggle of being a Christian in a fallen world. So beginning uh, in about verse 12, he begins to tell us about the sufferings that Christians are going to have. And he mentions several different kinds of things that God has provided for us in the midst of the struggle. For I believe the Christian life is a tension-filled life to maturity. None of us are without problems. None of us are without pain. I'm sure in the uh, audience here, in the audience by television, there's uh, experiences that I could not imagine of pain and disappointment, of problems and needs, of, of a sense, where is God? Has He abandoned me in this? And I think this message is so important. Christians go through many problems. Number one, because they make really stupid choices. Amen? (laughs) It's pretty puny, but I know you mean it. We all make choices and we bear the consequences for them. There's no question about that. We also live in a fallen world system. Things happen to us because we live in a fallen world system that I wouldn't say is automatically God's will. And by that I mean... Things happen to us because we're a part of a corporate whole. Uh, Natural phenomenon, natural disasters, diseases. uh, There's a percentage of uh, of genetic problems that are going to be passed on to the next generation. Christians are not immune from those kinds of problems. Knowing Jesus is not uh, uh, a, a safeguard against life's turmoils. No. If it were, people become Christians for all the wrong reasons. But this chapter gives us some wonderful uh, uh, rays of, of light into the perspective that should guide our lives. The first real help is that when we are Christians, we realize that we are the sons of God by adoption. Yes, it's a mental awareness that no matter what we're going through, the promises of the Word of God are such that whosoever will may come because of the death of Christ. Oh, the wonder of being called the children of God. The second great thing here that's going to help us in times of struggle is the fact that the second coming is closer today than it was when we went to bed last night. I don't know when it's going to come. I don't know how it's going to come. I'm not sure of all the events that are going to precede it and accompany it. But I know the eastern sky is going to roll back one day. I know the trump of the archangel and the shout is going to come one day. 
and I know I'm going to meet him in the air. The Bible calls that our hope, and it refers to the second coming. Our destiny is sure. Now, starting with verse 26, is two more hopes, two more mainstays in a world that is awash in sin and rebellion and problems and needs and overwhelming pain. What can we do? Verse 26 says, in the same way, now you know that that is an author's way of saying something else connected to what I said just before. Uh, along with our adoption as sons, along with our hope of the second coming, comes this. What? In the same way, the Spirit, too, is helping us in our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself pleads for us with unspeakable yearnings. Now, the Spirit is helping us in our weakness. Uh, this is a present middle verbal form. You say, is that important? I think it's important. I think many times we're afraid to, uh, to talk about that because I know all of you don't know Greek, but I'm going to tell you what it means and then if I am wrong, you can check me and see. This means the Spirit just doesn't help us when we're good or in mountain, mountain peak times. The Spirit is continually helping us. And the middle voice here means that He is personally, intimately involved in the process of helping us. What does our weakness mean? Well, it could mean the weakness of Romans chapter 7, trying to be religious without the power of the Holy Spirit, trying to live the Christian life in our own strength. What a disaster that brings. Or it could be the, the pain and suffering in Romans 8 that comes in a fallen world as all creation groans and agonizes and even the believer groans. It could be our, own, our personal choice to sin. To, to be apathetic and walk away from our God. All of these weaknesses, I think, are included in this. He's helping us, continuing to help us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should. Uh, I, this little cliche I use quite often, I believe it's so true though, that the worst thing that God could do for most of us is to answer our prayers. For we are praying for all the wrong things. Uh, we, we are praying for things that are uh, uh, material, things that are for ourselves, things that are for our consumption and pleasure. And we know these things pull our hearts away from the Lord, and yet we pray for them. I, I think it's, there's a biblical precedent that, that believers do not know how to pray. I would even be so bold as to say that Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane did not know exactly how to pray where he asked the Father to remove the cup of suffering that had been planned before the foundation of the world that he should die on behalf of men. And now he entreats the Father three times that he wouldn't have to go to the cross. I think Jesus in his humanity was struggling with what to pray. I think Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, where he prays for the thorn in the flesh to be removed, whatever that was, he said, God, take this out of my life. Three times he prayed. And God said, no, Paul, this is better for you and for me. Paul did not know how to pray. I think of James chapter 2, where we're praying for things from God, but we're praying to spend them on our own lust. We don't know how to pray. How often in situations... I have to pray, God, what is, whatever your will is, we want, because I must admit to you, I don't always know what God's will is. But the Spirit is going to help us when we don't know how to pray. And how will the Spirit help us? But the Spirit himself pleads. Now, Don's translation said intercedes. And that's a wonderful way. The Spirit himself intercedes or pleads for us. I, this thought hit me a few years ago, and I, I have just been tickled about it ever since. Here we have, as Christians, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now, earlier Romans 8, it made it very plain. If you have the Spirit, you're a Christian. If you don't have the Spirit, you're not a Christian. It, it, it's not uh, if, maybe, could be. If you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says He indwells us. The Holy Spirit is nothing less than part of the Trinitarian God. He is deity. 
and He lives within each one of us. And He prays for us. That's what this passage is all about. But not only does the God, the Spirit, indwell us, but the resurrected, glorified Jesus Christ, sitting at the right hand of the Father, also intercedes for us. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I'm writing you that you may not sin. But if you sin, we have an advocate. That's the very same word used for the Holy Spirit in John 14 and 16. We have an advocate, a paraclete with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We've got the resurrected Jesus Christ interceding for us. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit interceding for us. And God the Father sent both of them for us. We've got the whole Trinitarian God on our side. It's not a reluctant Father the Son pleads to, the Spirit prays to. It's a loving parent. Oh my, the, the whole triune God is for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it continues then with unspeakable yearnings. I want to stop here because I think there's some, some difference of opinion and, and I want to speak to it. Uh, it's a little theological aside and yet I think it is part of the traditional interpretation of this passage that I want to question a bit. I have heard it said many times that this uh, 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 groanings unspeakable refers to speaking in tongues, a prayer language. Now, I want to make a couple of statements about that. Number one, I believe that tongues are a valid gift. And the reason I... Don't get nervous, I don't do it. I believe it's a valid gift. Because I believe the Bible. And I believe the Bible is the Word of God. And I don't have the right to take a gift out that I don't like or don't understand or has been abused. To tell you the truth, every gift of the Holy Spirit has been abused. Amen? Are there false preachers somewhere in our world today behind a pulpit? The gift of preaching has been abused. Is prayer abused? Is stewardship abused? Is giving abused? Of course. Tongues has been abused. Yes, it has, as every other gift. But just because we don't have it or understand it doesn't mean it's not a gift. So I want to affirm that I believe that speaking in tongues is a valid, current, spiritual gift. But I also want to say this passage can't refer to speaking in tongues. Because speaking in tongues is a gift only for a few. I get, I get, I want to get my feelings hurt when people say to me, uh, do you speak in tongues? No. Well, God bless you. Pray a little more. Read a little more. Maybe you'll get spiritual someday. Yuck! Now, I, I want to spit on that deal. That, that's bad. Now, I want to tell you where in the Bible I think that's not valid. And I want you to write this down because if you haven't heard this argument, you will. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 28 through 30 is a series of questions in Greek. Now, in Greek, there's a little particle that tells you it's a question. And depending on which one of these little particles is used, tells you if the author expects a yes answer to the question or if the author expects a no answer to the question. Now, the may article is in every one of these sentences, these questions, which means this. He's asking a question that he expects a no answer to. We do not all have the gift of blank, do we? Implication, no. And it goes right down the list. We're not all apostles, we're not all teachers, we're not all evangelists. Right on down, we don't all speak in tongues, do we? No. That should kick in the head once and for all that tongues are for everybody or that tongues are a sign that you're saved or that tongues makes you more spiritual. That's not true. But that is, there's another side to this. 1 Corinthians 14, 39, please. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says, I speak in tongues more than any of you. I wish that all of you would speak in tongues, Paul says. And then he comes to say, I desire, desire earnestly that you prophesy. Now, prophesy in the context of Corinthians means share the gospel. It can mean one-on-one -on -one or in a corporate setting. It means proclaim the gospel. But then he says, do not forbid them to speak in tongues. So when I say this does not refer to tongues, I am not trying to be negative, but I'm saying this to you. This is a hope and a promise for every Christian, not just for some that speak in tongues. See what I'm saying to you? And by the way, the groanings seem to be syntactically not related to the individual Christian that's groaning to the Father, but the Spirit that's speaking to the Father. So in this passage, I don't think it's valid, though I'm not trying to take away the whole deal. Does that make sense to you? It just won't apply here, for this is for all of us. Have you ever got the place in your life 
that maybe you've got to have a relative that's in pain or trouble. You've got a son or a daughter that you don't know what to pray about. Things just caved in on you all at once and you sit down ready to pray and you just don't know how to pray. I want to tell you, I go on mission trips a lot. Take a lot of young people with me. Now, folks, you ought to take young people into a culture that you don't have no idea what's going to happen before you get really nervous, right? There are days I am so tired at the end of the day when I get back to my room. This is the prayer I pray. Oh, God, you know my heart. Amen. Boing, I'm dead. <laughs> and I don't know what else to pray. Boy, I'm just beat down emotionally and physically. You ever been there? The Spirit will pray for us. We do not even have to understand all that He's saying for us. We know that God who knows our hearts. The Spirit that knows us and knows the mind of God will intercede for us. What a wonderful promise that in the midst of life's problems we're not alone, that God Himself is interceding on our behalf. Oh, hallelujah, what a promise amidst the problems of life. In verse 27 is a beautiful title for God the Father. He who searches our hearts. That's a title for God. God knows the motives. He knows the reasons why. Oh, the number of passages I could quote for this would be innumerable. I hope you have a reference Bible. And we'll look them up. God who knows us. He, he, he knows us. The God who knows the hearts searches the reins, the way King James puts it, knows what the Spirit thinks. And then it comes to this. For he pleads, the Spirit, the Spirit pleads for his people in accordance with the will of God. Oh my, I'm so grateful for the Spirit's work in my life. And then comes this wonderful passage all of us know, Romans 8, 28. There are two manuscripts, ancient manuscripts, that have God causes all things to work together for good. There is one papyrus manuscript, very old, that said God works all things together for good. Most of the other Greek manuscripts just have all things work together for good, but the implication of the whole passage is that God is the one that does it. So I remember the pain when I, as a young Christian, I read this. I guess the time that really got me the most is when I was listening to the radio one night and I I heard the story about a bus full of a Baptist young people going to a church camp in South Texas. Late one night, driving to try to get to that camp, on an icy bridge, they were hit by an 18-wheeler. Thirty-four people died that night in that Baptist bus. Whole families were wiped out. And I thought to myself, oh God, how can we possibly say all things work together for good in a world where this kind of thing happens? I remember even earlier than that in my life, sitting in my comfortable chair in my living room with my air conditioner just right, eating things out of my icebox, watching my color TV. And for the first time in my adult life, I remember seeing the Biafran War. I had never seen the effects of malnutrition on children before. I had never seen emaciated bodies. I had never seen massacre. I thought, oh, God. Oh, God, how can, how can the Bible say all things work together for good in a world like this where people who've never even heard your name are being slaughtered and dropping off into an eternity without you? God, how can this world be in any sense good? I want you to look in your Bibles at verse 29. For what we've done in this passage is read our definition of good into it without looking at the context. What is the good that God says He'll work out? It's not that everything happens to us is good. My soul, there are some bad things in our world. But the good, look at verse 29, is that we be conformed to the image of His Son. There's the good. The one unalterable goal of God for every Christian is not health or wealth or prosperity or even heaven when you die. The ultimate goal of God for every child is Christ-likeness. And from Romans chapter 5, verse 8, I know that Jesus was perfected by the things that He suffered. We draw closer to God in times of problems. I want to say again to you this book. It's helped me so much in this area. The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah C. 
Smith has helped me to grab emotionally and practically the truth of this passage. No, all things aren't good, but all things can be used for our becoming more like Christ. I believe that with all my heart. It's changed my eyes and the way I look at the world. It's changed my perspective. Bob, there are evil people and, and Satan and, and, and all kind of things are after me. I've learned to kiss the hand of whatever comes into my life because I believe that my daddy is in control of all things and my life is not in control by horoscopes or fate or luck or chance or maybe or could be or possibly or if only. My daddy holds my hand. No one can pluck me out of my father's hand and everything that comes in my life can be used for my spiritual growth and if it's too much for me to handle... 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, He will not allow it to come. Now, I don't know what you're going through, what pain you bear, what you have in your life, but I pray right now the Spirit of God will let you translate that into what I'm saying. All things work together for good. Two conditions. To those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Paul never mentions our love for God except here. It's always God's love for us. But there is a condition. You've got to know that God loves you. You've got to love Him. You've got to be available for His will, not your own, or peace will never come. So here is the second one. Not only do we have an indwelling Holy Spirit that intercedes for us, but we know that all things work together for good. And then in verses 29 through 30 is a series of things from eternity past before the spoken creation to eternity future. They're all in aorist tense in Greek. They're all put in a completed action mode. The last one is future. None of us are glorified yet. We won't be glorified till we see Christ face to face and are changed into His likeness at the second coming, 1 John 3, 2. But because it's so sure it's going to happen, it's also put in a past tense mode, a completed mode. What God did before the foundation where He foreknew us. Now, that doesn't mean that He knew who was going to choose Him and therefore He picked them. If that's true, then salvation is based on man's works. 